Hi, um, thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, this session, session is on where does women's oppression come from and how can we end it? Um, so my name is Karen Buckley and I'm a Countifier member. Um, our speaker for this session is going to be Ele um, Elaine Graham Lee. Um, so um, Elaine, is a, she speaks and writes widely on issues of climate change, women's liberation and social justice, and she's a member of Counterfire. She's an author of A Diet of Austerity, Class, Food and Climate Change, um, Marx and the Climate Crisis, and she has contributed a chapter to Counterfire's um, short book, Marxism and Women's Liberation. A sci-fi novel, um, The Kaduka, I think I've said that right, <laughs> is out with the Comrade Press. Um, so Elaine will speak for about 25 minutes and we'll have time after them for contributions, questions, and any other comments that people want to make. Um, we'll need to finish on time at 1.15. So we'll start summing up just after about one-ish, something like that. Um, so yeah, and then after, so we'll bring, I'll bring Elaine in and then we'll have time after for the contribution. So yeah, so over to you, Elaine. Okay, um, thanks, Karen, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first part of the question. So where, where does women's oppression come from? Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with, with looking at, uh, in a sense, uh, the, 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 most, the most common view that I disagree with, which, is, which really takes the starting point the fact that women's oppression is the oldest oppression, which it is, uh, but then argues for really from that, that that means that, um, that it's always been there, that it would exist in any society, and it's basically innate to the human species. It's something about our biology that means that all, women's oppression is always going to be there. So basically, it's kind of, it's all men against all women is, is that position. Um, and against that, I'm going to be arguing that the Marxist position developed by Marx and by Engels, um, that, that women's oppression is a part of exploitation. It's there because it's a class society, is, is the correct way that we should look at it. So I'm going to ex explain that in a, in a bit more detail. And I'm going to start with um, this part of the, of the argument that says that it's about you know, how humans have evolved. It's about human biology, because that's something that, um, you know, kind of in, in the way that uh, the political arguments do, it kind of ebbs and flows. And there was a period sort of a few years where there weren't so many people arguing that. And I kind of was almost thinking, that, oh, maybe we've won that argument. And then, of course, it comes roaring back because this is how these things, these things go. So there have been a couple of recent attempts to kind of really revive that, that argument that, um, because of our evolution, therefore we will always have women's oppression. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. So the basic argument here, um, that obviously I disagree with, but this is the argument, is that, okay, men and women have evolved to have um, different behaviours and uh, different needs, different propensities, and this is because human evolution still thinks it's the Stone Age. So the argument is that, um, very basically, uh, men and women have different investments in, uh, in reproducing. So men have very low cost sperm, so they don't have to care about each individual sperm because they produce so many of them, and it doesn't take very many resources to produce a sperm. So they can spray their sperm around, sleep with lots and lots of women, and that's their evolutionary strategy to pass as many of their genes on as possible for the next generation. Whereas women have a high um, physical investment in each egg that they produce and obviously in each pregnancy because it's a lot of trouble so therefore women have to be much more choosy so therefore women don't want to sleep around they want to pick a man who's a good provider and will look after them while they're sitting in their cave bringing up their offspring and, uh, uh, and so on and so on so the argument is and the argument then adds all sorts of other things that uh, that men go out hunting mammoths and therefore they have lots of prestige compared to women who do boring things like uh, um, you know gathering uh, picking herbs and things like that and uh, and maybe men are naturally violent there's a whole kind of side thing here about the influence of testosterone and that therefore maybe men are naturally dominant because they have so much so much testosterone and so on but that's kind of the caricature and there's, and that basically says because of that difference in uh, in, in, in in investment physically and because our evolution has kind of stopped in the stone age that means that men and women will always have these propensities and any attempt uh, to to change human society so that you don't have a difference in a difference in status and difference in behavior between men and women is kind of doomed because we're basically we're, we're trapped by our biology and, they, and what's, what's interesting about the most recent versions of this argument is that what they do also is that they kind of they also caricature the obverse of that so that so the, 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 the things that I've read recently that are arguing this say that, well, if, you're, if you want to argue that our behavior isn't biological, then you have to be saying that it's completely ephemeral, 
that um, that if you're saying that sort of differences between men and women are from social conditioning, then this is kind of something that should be able to be overcome by a half hour training session. And if it's not, that shows it's biological. And I think partly this comes from, I think, an argument um, that, that people have been, uh, that, you know, seriously, people have been, have been arguing that sex itself is socially conditioned somehow, that it's not about the actual, the fact that there are two human sectors is, is not actually um, a biological reality, but it's something that is conditioned and that we should be able to throw off and is actually ephemeral and sort of unimportant. And I think, to be, to be clear, that is not correct. We do the, you know, the humans, like all other mam mammals, come into sexes with a very, very small number of people who have uh, disorders of development, which means that they can't be assigned accurately to work to one sex or another. But those are developmental disorders. Those don't represent a third sex. But it doesn't follow from that that we can say that all the other stuff about how men and women behave and so on is also true. So it's important to be really clear about that. And I think one mistake I think that both proponents of both of these sides of the argument in a sense make is that they're arguing from a, a profoundly dualist conception of how mind and body relate to each other. And it's important, so I'm going to spend a second on this because it's important to get it right. So the argument basically there is that um, if something is socially constructed, it somehow doesn't happen to your body. So you see this again and again when you can particularly have um, arguments in the media about, about whether a particular behavior is, is biological and therefore inevitable and so on. And they'll say, well, this particular thing like aggression or something like that shows up in a brain scan, therefore it must be innate. And what that's effectively saying is that if something is from social conditioning, it happens in the ghost in the machine the you that isn't physical and is floating around in your body and doesn't actually relate to your body at all. It's, just very, it's a very dualist conception. And what that's missing is that everything that happens to us happens in our brains. We, it hasn't got anywhere else to be. We aren't separate from our bodies. So people's experiences at, actually do shape how their, how their brains are constructed. And all the pathways in our brains are actually made in, in development by us thinking. Babies make their brains by thinking, which I just think is such a neat um, illustration of, uh, of, of how the, all these things are relational. And I really, really like that, that fact. But the point, therefore, is that you can't make that separation between something is socially conditioned and therefore doesn't appear in our physical brains and our physical bodies, or something does appear physically and therefore it's innate and it's because of evolution and we can't change it. We can't make that separation. And in fact, um, there have been some very good um, work, particularly, say, by Cordelia Fine, who's poured a lot of cold water on the idea that if you can see something on a brain scan, that means that it goes back to the Paleolithic and so on. And her work has pointed out that actually there's very few um, genuine sort of average differences between men and women um, that you can't that can't be controlled for in all sorts of things like behavior and ability to do maths and all of that sort of thing. But actually, despite the centuries of social conditioning that say that men do these things and women do those things there's actually very little difference that you can that you can see so it's, so i think that's an that understanding that that argument is based on this sort of dualist understanding of uh, how brains and bodies work is i think important for understanding how um, actually we can combat this argument that uh, that it's all about evolution it's all biology and it's all innate and uh, 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 and inescapable and, and it always it, it always does strike me that when I, when I read these the biological accounts about you know life in the Paleolithic, it, it it always seems to me that it sounds very much more like the Flintstones than it actually does to any um, real reconstructions of a human uh, human prehistory, and that's because it basically is the Flintstones. So all of these sort of these ideas in evolutionary psychology start from okay, women stay at home and look after the children, and men go out to work hunting the mammoth or whatever, and it's kind of it's starting. From those assumptions that um, that those divisions in human behavior are innate and inevitable so therefore of course it finds that they're innate and inevitable because they're finding what they're looking for it doesn't actually have any basis of what we understand about um, how human societies worked and in fact actually we have a lot of basis to think that before um, societies were class societies and egalitarian societies you probably wouldn't have women's oppression we have we have some very good evidence that we don't because we do have evidence of of, of societies in, you know, in the historical period who didn't have class and who also didn't have women's oppression. So in Engels, um, he talks about a, a, a 
um, a group who he calls the Iroquois, but they're actually the Haudenosaunee, who are a First Nations people in the, uh, in the US, and who actually also 19th century feminists in America found very inspiring, because although they had different roles for men and women, they really did have equal status. And, and, equal, and equal say in what the tribe would do and how you know decisions would get made and so on. So it was very it was very very noticeable that because they didn't have class, they didn't have women's oppression. And there are other examples as well, which Engels I don't think did know about, like um, uh, sort of towns in uh, in ancient Anatolia and the Indus Valley, which are actually very complex civilizations. You know, it's not the case that okay, well if you've got a band of hunter gatherers where there's ten of them and they're practically starving to death, then you don't have to have uh, class and women's oppression. You know, these are actually very sophisticated societies, but they don't have class and they don't have women's oppression. And we have evidence of things like in Capital Hayek, which is one of these Anatolian towns, where we have um, sort of wall paintings of things like men looking after children and things like that so we can kind of see that they don't have that sort of profound difference in the in, in gender roles that that we expect from uh, uh for, from societies that do have women's oppression um so all of that suggests that um that it is right to argue that this is all because of um class society you know, when you when you don't have exploitation in society you also don't have oppression so you could conclude from that that, OK, well, this is just because exploitation makes people nasty. So under an exploited, exploitative society, therefore, individual men want to oppress individual women. And, you know, it's true that actually the effects of, uh, of living in an exploitative society are very bad for people generally. But um, but that doesn't mean that it, that we can go back to that argument that oh, effectively it's individual men oppressing individual women. This is a systemic thing. Now, for the origins of women's oppression, obviously this happened long before we have really any systematic written evidence. Uh, we have, a, you know, so we can't we, we can't say, oh, well, this source tells us this is how women's oppression arose. But we do have actual written sources for how other oppressions arise because they're much later and we do have historical evidence. So we have evidence about effectively the imposition. Of, of racism on British society and other Western societies, because that happens in the, sort of the late medieval, early modern period. So we can see it happening. And we can see from that, that it's not something that people just spontaneously do. It's something that's encouraged by, created and encouraged by the ruling class as a way of buttressing their exploitative system. It's specifically with racism, it's uh, to do with justifying the slave trade. But we can see that it's, it, it exists because it's of use to the system of exploitation. So we can we can surmise from that that actually you know, this is what a, this is what oppression is for. So this is presumably what a, what women's oppression is for. So the the origins of women women's oppression in class we in a class society are there to again to to um, to buttress this system of uh, of exploitation. It's not something that arises because men are nasty because men are nasty in a class society. It's something because it 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 benefits the rulers for there to be this system. But I think, but that that then rise, um, uh, raises the question that okay, well, that's what oppression is for. But why women's oppression specifically? Why isn't the oldest oppression women oppressing men? Why isn't the oldest oppression racism? Why don't you get racism in the Bronze Age? Because you don't. Um, and, and again, there's been some sort of recent representations of this. This was something that um, say I reviewed um, Laurie Penny's book fairly fairly recently, and this was something that she that she effectively does. That it kind of it appears completely arbitrary. That that okay, there's a systemic um, need for some sort of oppression, and it really is kind of completely random what sort of oppression it is. It just happens to be oppression of women, but it could have been anything. And I think it's really important there that we understand that there's a reason why it's women's oppression, why it isn't something else. But that also we don't allow this to slip back into arguments that, well, it's because men had higher status because they went out hunting the mammoths and therefore they were seen as much more important than women and so on. Because, none, because first of all, there's no evidence for any of those. Um, there's a whole there's a whole gamut of arguments about meat eating and the status of meat eating, which I'm really not going to pursue at length here, but uh, um, just uh, 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 throw in that the major source of um, animal protein in um, Stone Age diets was rabbits. You don't get a lot of high status for being the mighty warrior attacking a rabbit with a spear, you know, so that, that whole argument that men are seen as great warriors doesn't doesn't work for why men who might have higher status than women and therefore why it might be women's oppression that that. Uh, um, that, that gets put in place. Um, but I think the, problem, the, the wider problem with those arguments is that it's kind of a way really of sort of slipping back in the idea that this is all innate, innate and inevitable kind of by the back door. So we need to look in a bit of detail at how we think um, class arose.
So this is again, this is this is um, relying very much on what Engels says uh, about the about how class arose and how that uh, resulted in what he calls the historic defeat of the female sex. Um, so basically, this is a creation of agriculture because once you have the development of agriculture, you have pretty much for the first time you have a surplus, and you also have a reason to keep the surplus because if you're a mobile um, hunter gatherer society, you know where do you put your stuff? You have to keep packing it up and carrying it around with you. It's a pain. Whereas once you have set, once you have um, settled um, communities that are practicing agriculture and developing a surplus, there's a point to turning this into fancy buildings, heavy stuff, you know, metal working and so on, because you don't have to carry it around with you. You can put it in your storeroom and look at it and think, oh, I've got all this stuff. It's great. So um, to start with, you have, you know, it, it's not the case that class emerges immediately, you have a surplus, that's important to note, but what you have, you have the emergence of a sort of chief figure who, um, to start with, um, sees to it that there is fair, fair distribution, because uh, these early societies are egalitarian, they want to make sure everything is shared out fa fairly. But unfortunately, that sometimes historically, not inevitably, but did um, mean that that then starts to develop into a hierarchy. So the, the chiefs are the people who control material wealth. And so that then becomes that actually they want to control it and give it out to their supporters and make sure they carry on being chief and so on. And that's at the point then when you've kind of got a class system developing. You start putting walls around the center of the chiefly power, the chiefs retainers become, become tax collectors, and then you've got a class society. So it's important to know at this point that there's nothing here that means it's inevitable that the chiefs have to be men. I mean, women are involved in agricultural production just as, as men are. So this isn't the point about this is how it becomes women's oppression. And in fact, we do have... It's fairly discredited now, but I do think that there is a reasonable amount of evidence from things like Greek myths and so on that suggests that the idea that some of these very early class societies might have been matriarchal is not completely bonkers. I mean, it's not really bang to rights, but I don't think we can entirely write this off. But what we have to understand, therefore, is that if you've got maybe some societies where it's a woman who's the chief who puts the walls around and says, right, my retainers are tax collectors now, I'm controlling the surplus, and others where it's a man who does that, the reason, there's a reason why the patriarchal version wins. And I think that that's because, that it, because it gives um, a reason for more men in, who are exploited in this new class society to identify with the class society rather than opposing it. So we have to understand these early class societies are incredibly unstable. And there, there's constant class struggle. We've got some examples of actually successful revolutions of overthrowing the class societies, which is some jolly good. And, and plenty of people, times actually where people just say, you know what, I'm not into this whole class thing. I'm going to go join the barbarians, live outside the city, outside class society, because actually that's, that, that's better for me. And they have this constant struggle to actually hold on to enough people. It's all incredibly contested. And the thing about um, women's oppression is, is what we have to look at is what that gives to the men who are being who are being exploited, who are lower down in the class hierarchy. And what this does to them, and this is what Engels says, is it allows them to know that they're passing on their property onto their actual children. Because the only way that you know if you're a man that you're that, that you're passing your property onto your actual children is if you control the women that you're having the children with. And in a wider sense, what controlling the women does is enables men to control the reproduction of labour in their household. So what effectively it's saying to men who are being exploited is that, OK, well, you're being exploited. You have to pay taxes to the chief. You have to you know, join his war band and, and do, do what you're told. But at home, you get, control, get to control the reproduction of labour in this whole household. So you're the little king of your household. And that's enough of a benefit for enough of the men who are being exploited in the society that they're prepared to actually go to go along with it. So I think that this means that um, the patriarchal societies therefore become much more the, the stable version of the class societies than ones who are based on based on a different uh, a different oppressive system. So therefore, that's why I think women's oppression becomes the dominant model. So the important thing to, to note there is that it does arise, in a sense, from female biological characteristics because it's about controlling reproduction, you know, the physical reproduction of humans and reproduction of labour. So women's reproduction function is obviously important part of that. So this isn't kind of free floating oppression that just says, oh, well, because this is a decision to exploit people who have long hair and wear sparkly beads. You know, this is about women's biology, but it's not innate to women's biology. It's not the case that in a non-class society, women would be oppressed because they're the ones who actually have the children. That's a really important distinction to, uh, um, to understand. But it is the case, as, as we can see from the, the completely appalling um, decision that's happened in, the, in, in America with the you know, 
uh, removing Roe versus Wade. So that's actually so still some of the sharpest um, experiences that we have as women of, of our oppression is around, to, is, is around reproduction, whether that's the right to abortion, whether that's the right to contraception, whether that's maternity pay and so on. So that's, you know, that, that shows us how it is related to our biology, but it's important that it's not because we are inherently exploitable or oppressible because we're, because we're women. So I think that's, that's important to get, to get a handle on that. Um, as I move on to the second, uh, the second question, it's just um, how, do we, how do we end it? So I think the first, the first thing to say here is that it's important that we don't um, go along with the kind of idea, which I think is kind of wishful thinking, that women's oppression doesn't have any relation to material reality. You know, as I've explained, we can see from the origins of women, women's oppression that it is um, inherently related to material reality. We can't, you know, it would be very nice if we could say effectively, well, we'll just say that sex doesn't exist. We'll just, we'll just say that this is all uh, free floating signifiers and it doesn't really matter. And then that would just wipe out women's oppression. It'd be much easier if that was the case, but it really, really isn't. And we're not doing anyone any favors by pretending that, um, that, that we as women can, as individuals can identify out of women's oppression, that somehow it doesn't, that somehow it doesn't apply to us. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's damaging, I think, because it means that it's much more difficult for women to, for women to stand together in solidarity against women's oppression, if in a sense we're, we're adopting um, an understanding of women's oppression that implies that, well, you could identify out of it. So if you haven't, then it means you kind of like it really. So I think it's important that we understand that this is something that, ha that happens to, that, that you know, that, that applies to all women, kind of regardless of what we do individually. I mean, my point about um, some of the sharpest uh, experiences of women's oppression as, uh, for us as individual women is often around reproduction. But it doesn't mean that if we don't reproduce, then we're exempt from that. I mean, I've been paid less in my life because I'm a woman and be because women have children. But I personally don't have children. But that doesn't mean that I got like a £5,000 bump in my salary when it's clear I wasn't going to reproduce. You know, it had it, the the reason, the reason why women are paid less is to do to, with reproduction, but my pay isn't to do with my personal reproductive choice, choices. But I think the main point here about how, how we, uh, yeah, how we um, fight against women's oppression is that we have, to make, we have to do so on the understanding that it's not the case that all men are the enemy. No, this is a creation of class society. It's not something that all men individually do to all women individually. And what we have to recognize is that because it is part of class and it's because, of, because it's part of the class system is that we have class interests in common with proletarian men as, uh, as proletarian women. And we have more interests in common with um, proletarian men than we do with bourgeois women. So the idea that this is all women against all men and we can put everything else aside in a sense is not actually going to get us very far. I mean, that's the version of feminism that gets you saying, well, Condoleezza Rice is a uh, um, defense secretary or whatever. So I can't remember what her title was now. You know, she's a member of the um, uh, imperialist US government. Therefore, that's an advance for women. You know, it wasn't an advance for women when Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister. It was an advance for women to have uh, women as the CEOs of, uh, of, of companies that are that, that are cutting our wages and cutting our jobs and, and attacking our working conditions and so on. You know, the, the, the small successes of a small number of bourgeois women do not actually chip away at women's oppression. What does chip away at women's oppression actually is class victory. So I think it's it's it's, much, it's actually much better for women, the enormous success of the OMT strikes this week, than getting a woman in the boardroom. So we have to recognise that we have a class, that we have a class interest with, with men. And therefore, I don't think that the kind of separatist feminist struggle that does posit all men as the enemy is, 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 is the way forward. We have to have solidarity. I mean, obviously, the, the, the struggle against women's oppression has to be led by women because otherwise it's yes yet another thing where men are talking over us but that's not the same as saying that men can't participate in our struggle because it is actually in the interests of men as well you know as a, like i said oppression exists because it supports the exploitative system without oppression as arguably class class societies would arguably never actually won out over egalitarian societies so it follows therefore that actually it's 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 enormously in men's interests to see, in a sense see through the kind of marginal gains that women's oppression gives them to see the bigger prize is actually a, 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 a society without exploitation and the final thing that I think I would say for you know, how we end it, which again is kind of a you know, don't make this mistake kind of thing. But I think sometimes in feminism, I mean, 
because I think that there's the generations in, in feminism, there's a tendency um, for each, each wave, if you like, to want to dismiss everything that's gone before. And I think that's a fundamental mistake. I mean, this whole talk is about how we understand women's oppression in terms of the history of how it arises and so on. And I think the idea that we can just um, start every sort of generation of feminism from scratch as if nothing has gone before. Is, is a mistake. And I think we have we have a huge amount to learn from second wave feminism, from you know, the suffragettes and so on, you know, from those histories of women's struggle, that, that, that as women struggling against oppression in the 21st century, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think if, and I think uh, struggle against women's oppression that, that recognizes that and thinks, okay, we, you know, we, are we are standing on the shoulders of these victories and we are taking that forward rather than starting from scratch every time is in a much better position. So I think that is pretty much 25 minutes. So I will stop there and look forward to hearing what you all think. Okay, thanks very much for that, Elaine. Really interesting um, talk.